my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place to come together and share childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Pre-Mama Wellness. Pre-Mama creates doctor-backed supplements that support every stage of your maternity wellness journey. From balancing hormones to trying to conceive, pregnancy, postpartum recovery, and breastfeeding nutritional support. All Pre-Mama supplements are gluten-free, non-GMO, vegan or vegetarian, with no additives and no synthetic flavors. Discover why moms and dads-to-be trust Pre-Mama Wellness for their nutritional support by visiting premamawellness.com. You can use the code BIRTHHOUR25 for 25% off your purchase. At the end of this episode, I'll be talking to Kaylee all about Pre-Mama Wellness and their offerings. Again, that code is BIRTHHOUR25 for 25% off at premamawellness.com. Before we get to today's episode, I just want to remind everybody about our Know Your Options Childbirth course. You can find out more information about this comprehensive online course at thebirthhour.com slash course, and you can use the code 100OFF for $100 off enrollment. I'd also love to welcome any and all of you to our Patreon group. If you head over to patreon.com slash birth hour, you can support the podcast and get fun benefits in return, like access to all of our archived episodes. That's hundreds of episodes not available on the main podcast feed, access to our private Facebook group. It's such a great supportive membership to be a part of, and we would love to welcome you in there. There's also other perks in there, as well as our partner podcast hosted by my husband interviewing partners on their perspective of pregnancy, birth, and postpartum. You can see all of the different options and tiers at patreon.com slash birth hour and get a discount by pledging annually. Today's birth story guest is Liz. She's going to be sharing her journey with infertility and then her birth story, which was a hospital birth with midwives. She was also a member of our Know Your Options childbirth course. So she talks about how she really gained so much from being a part of that community and the Zoom calls that we have regularly there. So I know I mentioned it earlier, but again, you can find out more information about the course at thebirthhour.com slash course and use the code 100OFF to get $100 off enrollment. All right, let's get to Liz's birth story. Hi, Liz. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for coming on the podcast today. Hi, Bryn. Thanks so much for having me. I am a longtime listener, and I'm so, so excited to be here to tell my story today. Amazing. Well, I'm excited to have you on. Um, Before we get to your story, can you tell listeners a little bit about you and your family? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my husband, Eric, and I live in Chicago. And in our household, we have our what I call our first baby, Bug the Pug, and then our newest addition, Emmeline, who arrived just in December 2021. So she is coming up on 12 weeks uh, right now. All right. So I know that you have a good bit to share about your trying to conceive journey. So let's start there. Yeah, absolutely. So in 2018, we had been married for coming up on a year and had wanted to start trying to have a baby. And I had somewhere along the way started working with a midwife for just kind of well woman care and had decided that was the direction I wanted to go when when we did get pregnant. And we ended up getting pregnant a first time really quickly, like month one of, of officially trying. And that ended in a pretty early miscarriage Um, My dating based on kind of the length of my cycle was a little off. So we went in around what would have been eight weeks based on my cycle to have an initial ultrasound. And the baby was measuring around six weeks. There was a fetal pole and, and not much else. And my midwife let us know that it could be just a dating issue because I had long cycles, but it could be that we're in this sort of gray period of like, is this baby still growing or had it had it stopped growing? So we had a period of a week where we had to wait to go in to get another ultrasound and look at growth. And we found out then that we had had a miscarriage. So it was a little bit of a tough start to trying to have a baby. Um, But we really thought at that point that it would be 
you know, figure a few things out, try again, and hopefully get pregnant again within the next few months. And that was not not what ended up happening. So with that miscarriage, I decided to have a DNC dilation and curatage. And we had a bit of a complication with that. My cycle didn't come back after about two months following that DNC. And I I checked in with my midwife and said, you know, you let me know if after eight weeks, if my cycle didn't come back to, to check in. And we ran some additional blood tests, checked my HCG levels at that point, And they were still high enough where there was some sort of retained tissue from that pregnancy. So I ended up needing to have a second DNC. So it was kind of a ongoing and heartbreaking saga that started our our journey to parenthood but after that we talked with my midwife I had kind of a follow up appointment with her and she asked kind of off the cuff do you don't have any thyroid issues do you and I said no I don't think so and then I kind of thought about it again and realized that at some point my primary care physician had brought up that I had slight thyroid um, hormone irregularities. And it was like nothing to write home about at that time, but she'd even written in notes in my records um, to check in when we were talking about trying to conceive. And I had forgotten. So we we honestly thought that I would do some adjusting, get on a thyroid medicine. Um, I had slight hypothyroidism and I really thought, we'll get this adjusted. My cycles actually shortened up then and we thought, okay, now we're on our way to having a baby. And it turned out that was not the case. So that's that's kind of the long beginning of our story. Okay. So then once you kind of got that stuff leveled out, then what happened next for you guys? Yeah. So from there, I guess that was all during 2019 was kind of trying post miscarriage. And we never had another positive pregnancy test during that time. So by early 2020, I went back to my midwife, brought up, you know, I'm I'm getting close to being 35. We haven't had a positive in close to a year. And she suggested running some initial blood tests and then also referred me to a reproductive endocrinologist. So during 2020, Eric and I spent a good amount of time kind of going through different stages of fertility treatment. We started with intrauterine inseminations or IU and did three of those with Clomid and then another ovulation enhancing drug called Letrozole. And those were not successful. So in the fall of 2020, we dove into IVF. And this, as obviously you know, was in the midst of the start of the COVID pandemic. So we did not have a face-to-face appointment with our reproductive endocrinologist until we were getting into the IVF process. So we went to a large fertility clinic, dealt with a really wonderful nurse that was kind of with me and my main um, contact the whole time, but only talked to our doctor via telehealth um, kind of calls during all of that time. So it's one of those weird things about the COVID period of time, whether it's you know pregnancy or fertility related, where I remember we went on a kind of little COVID vacation where we rented an Airbnb in in Cape Cod and we had our first consultation for fertility treatment there and just did a lot of things where I would go in and do blood draws or do whatever sort of treatment we needed, but very, very little of the kind of in-person interaction. And during that time too, fertility treatment is a rough thing to go through. And I you know, wanted support of people that understood and were going through the same things, but there were not the usual in-person support groups or anything going on during that period of time in 2020. So I ended up joining an online support group that was amazing just for education, for camaraderie. We had bi-weekly calls, kind of like we do for the birth hour for the Know Your Options course that I'll talk about a little bit later. But that was just seriously a godsend for me to talk with people during that time from all over the country and all over the world to um, have support and have people to understand kind of what we were going through. So we ended up doing an IVF egg retrieval in the fall of 2020, and we 
were really successful getting a lot of of eggs. I, it was a crazy number, something like in the 40s, I think, of eggs that they retrieved. Had a little bit of a complication because my ovaries were so stimulated getting all of those eggs. I had a little bit of what's called ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome afterwards and ended up with a night in the hospital because of that sort of condition and a CAT scan to make sure that my ovaries weren't twisting in something called torsion. So a little bit of kind of complications along the way there, but we ended up with nine fertilized embryos that grew to be day five embryos that we had ready and frozen and then genetically tested and waiting for us. And out of those nine, um, seven of them were considered viable and genetically quote unquote normal. And so we headed into an embryo transfer in early 2021. And that first embryo transfer, we transferred one embryo. We didn't know if it was a boy or a girl. That was unsuccessful. And we actually had a second embryo that was supposed to be thawed and transferred that day, but it did not survive the thawing process. So we went from seven embryos waiting for us to losing two that day. And and we have five left at that point. And I guess that takes me to the point where we're getting into when I actually did get pregnant. So I can dive into that now if you want. Yeah, that sounds great. So after, I think it was February is when we did that initial embryo transfer and we decided to wait a couple of months just to kind of recover physically and emotionally. And during that time, we decided to just keep trying the old fashioned way. And we had been trying for you know two plus years. I had been peeing on a lot of ovulation test strips and doing all of that. So we continued that in kind of March, April timeframe. And along with the ovulation test strips, I was always peeing on the little Amazon box of 50 pregnancy test strips. And the shock of a lifetime was after two plus years of not getting a positive one day, I just decided like, I'll do this before I was actually going to see my midwife for a well woman visit, peed on one of those little strips and saw the faintest of second lines. And I definitely always kind of thought I'd be that person that surprised my husband with some, you know, a little onesie or whatever the case was. And we did that back in 2018 when we were first pregnant. But this time I just yelled to him, I'm like, come into the bathroom. And I just showed him the stick. And I was like, is that a second line? <laughs> and... um and he was like, I think so, you know, like taking off his glasses, squinting at the thing. Um, and I ended up peeing on another stick that day, one of the kind of fancier ones to see if I could get any darker of a line. And and sure enough, it was there. So we ended up after this kind of journey and going through IUIs and IVF, we ended up conceiving um, what ended up being our daughter naturally. And oh goodness. Yeah, it was, it was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and that day was really fun to go into my midwife's office and she had, you know, been the one to recommend my RE to me and yeah. it had been there kind of all along the way. And I, she walks into the room and I said, you are not going to believe this. <laughs> I am pregnant. <laughs> and oh she was like, no way. And I said, yes, I have the test in my purse to show you. And <laughs> so I brought it out and she's like, yeah, that that's a second line. Oh my gosh. Wow. And um, so it was a really, a really cool start. Just you know, a total shock. Yeah. But it was really cool. I was with my midwife that day. She um, did a blood draw to check my HCG levels. And then I got in touch with my nurse and my reproductive endocrinologist. And they said, well, this is a natural pregnancy. You don't really need us to monitor it like an IVF pregnancy, but they were willing to continue to to see me for the first few weeks once we knew we were pregnant. And so they did follow up pregnancy tests, HCG tests a couple days later to see that the number was growing and doubling and it more, more than doubled. So that was a good sign. And then they let us do an early ultrasound at about six weeks, which they would do with, with IVF patients. Um, and my husband was able to come with me to that, which he wouldn't have been able to if we just did the first ultrasound with my, my midwives group. So it was really, really special to be there. My doctor was there for that um, personally. And that was really cool too, because there's so many doctors and so many nurses in this fertility practice that we were really happy to have her there. And she she knew what 
we had gone through, of course, and did the initial ultrasound and just kind of put her hand on my leg right away and said, there's a heartbeat. Like that was the first thing she said. Mm-hmm. And we just were like holding hands and just like could not believe it. So it was pretty magical. So that was the start of the journey. Oh, that's so amazing. And I love that that practice, like I know they deal with a lot of, you know, similar cases and everything, but just understanding all of the extra anxiety and heartache around having had losses and then the infertility struggle and everything that was so great that they continued to yeah. to serve you like that. Yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. It was, it was really special. And then my uh, midwife also during the first half of our pregnancy, she was super understanding and said, if you want to schedule more appointments than what we'd usually do the monthly, she let me do that. And we did a couple kind of mini ultrasounds just in the exam room to kind of quiet my fears. Yeah. So it was, it was amazing. <laughs> Good. All right. So let's, let's hear about, you know, how your pregnancy went. Yeah. Yeah. So once we knew we were pregnant, we knew numbers were doubling and everything. We were going shortly after we found out we were pregnant to another kind of little COVID vacation Airbnb in the Smoky Mountains. And we were meeting my brother and sister-in-law and little niece there. And that we really wanted to tell our parents we were pregnant before we saw my brother and sister-in-law. And so we did Zoom calls, of course, with my parents and with my in-laws. And that was really fun getting to tell them. We kind of had a funny situation where we were trying to tell my parents, we sent them this little gift in the mail with like a countdown to baby and whatever. And they were out of town and didn't get that. So we got on Zoom with them and showed our dog, Bug, who we're kind of obsessed with, you might be able to tell, and had him in a little t-shirt that said Big Brother on it. And my mom was super confused and got kind of upset. And she's like, are you getting another dog? (laughs) And (laughs) my dad was like next to her whispering, like, are they pregnant? (laughs) And, And I'm like, yes, we're pregnant. And then my mom's like, did you lie to us about when you were doing an embryo transfer? And we're like, no, we're pregnant naturally. So it was just really funny kind of telling them the news and they were ecstatic too. And then we saw my brother and sister-in-law and little niece, and we bought a t-shirt for her that said promoted to big cousin and dressed her up in that to tell them. So it was lots of fun things in in telling our family. And then um, from there, I would just say my pregnancy went really well and was pretty smooth. I had some nausea as you know, most people do. And I really only wanted to eat carbs during the first half of pregnancy. So I say I gained more mac and cheese weight than baby weight during the first half, but I felt pretty good by 12 or 13 weeks and everything kind of continued on as normal. I have a neuromuscular disease called Charcot-Marie Tooth. And because of that, my midwife recommended checking in with both a neurologist and a maternal fetal medicine doctor along the way. So I had one appointment each with those specialists and they both talked through what some possible risks were related to this neuromuscular disease I have. And there were things on the list like we could have had some growth restriction for the baby. There could be malpresentation, so the baby kind of in a weird position, or there was a a little bit of a higher risk of postpartum hemorrhaging, needing to use forceps or a vacuum during the delivery, kind of a lot of things like that. But during these discussions with both of those specialists, they, after kind of physically checking me out and talking through kind of my day-to-day life with this disease, they didn't have any big concerns. So I could still stay working with the midwives group. They also practiced with OBs. So it was very collaborative and definitely could have seen an OB if needed, but I kind of got the clear on that and everything continued on really well. And then during the second half of my pregnancy, I started to feel better about my body as I was getting an actual bump and not just kind of expanding in every direction. And I was really based on kind of talking things through with my midwife and with those specialists, I really was trying to do everything I could to get my body the most ready it could be to give birth. So I went to a chiropractor that did the Webster technique to try and make sure I was nice and aligned. And um, my midwife recommended I see a pelvic floor physical therapist before um, giving birth, which I know a lot of women do afterwards, but we kind of were trying to set me up for as much success as possible, being proactive with that. And I also did some acupuncture, which I had 
done while I was going through fertility treatments too. So I did that during first trimester and then kind of towards the end to help get my body ready for delivery and everything. And then I also started seeing a therapist again, just to again, be proactive and kind of talk through these big life stage shifts and having that person on my team already in case I did have postpartum depression or anxiety or anything kind of pop up like that. And we spent a lot of time talking about, to be honest, it was a lot of work stress during pregnancy that she helped me work through. But then also just the, what was I doing in pregnancy and preparing for motherhood? I was, I would say more nervous about being ready to take care of this baby when I brought it home than I was to actually go through the birth process. So we talked a lot about that and and the preparation so that it was really good to have kind of all these different people on my team as I was preparing. Yeah. So how much time did y'all spend like thinking about the birth and what kind of birth you wanted to have? Yeah, that's what I was just thinking. That was the kind of the next thing that, that came up as we were preparing was I honestly felt like I had so much knowledge already from listening to so many episodes of The Birth Hour. So good. (laughs) you helped me. I listened to The Birth Hour starting, I think, in 2018 before even like officially starting to try and have a baby. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So from that, I would say a couple things. One, we signed up for the Know Your Options childbirth course, and that was really great to watch the videos and talk through things with my husband on our own time, just through kind of the the second and third trimester. And then besides that, I did really want to do an in-person birth class if we were able to, given all the kind of COVID restrictions and everything. So we found a local organization that's run by a mother-daughter duo that does birth classes that are They're very well-rounded, but they're definitely focused on providing all of the different tools and information to go through an unmedicated birth if that's what you wanted. So we did that. It was five classes, five weeks in a row for two and a half or three hours each. And then they also did kind of one or two hour breastfeeding and kind of bringing home baby classes. So Eric and I did all of that in person. And I really wanted the camaraderie of being in a room with couples and being able to talk through things and everything. And that was amazing. And we ended up through that same organization. It's called Chicago Family Picnic. And I put it on my list of resources. Through that organization, we also found our doula team. So that's the other kind of piece of prep that we did was interviewing a couple of options and then hiring a team of doulas. One is actually the daughter in this mother-daughter duo that owns the business. And then she was paired up with another doula where they were on sort of an on-call schedule where depending on what day of the week and time of day you went into labor, one one or the other was on call. So we met with them both. We had pre-planning sessions to talk about our birth preferences and everything with both of them. And then we would have one of them there with us to support while we were giving birth. That's most of the prep we did. Okay. Anything else from pregnancy you want to share? I guess the only other thing that I would say is besides seeing, you know, a chiropractor and and all of that, I also just stayed really active throughout my pregnancy to try and prepare my body as much as possible. So I love doing like bar classes and things like that. So I continued regular like non-prenatal specific workouts through 30 plus weeks of pregnancy. And then I also started into some prenatal yoga classes, Pilates classes. And then I actually heard this organization mentioned on one of your episodes recently, Fit for Mom has prenatal classes that I did, I think all the way up until maybe my 38th week. And that was just amazing to have the community of people, whether it was virtual or in-person classes, and just really felt that my body was strong and ready for the birth process. So that was a huge thing for me, both mentally and physically. Yeah, that's awesome that you were able to keep doing that. Yeah, it was really fun. All right. So how did labor start for you? Okay. So leading up to 40 weeks, I had during my weekly appointments at 38 and 39 weeks, I was dilated to between one and two centimeters. And at the 39 and a half week appointment, I did have 
my membrane stripped. So that was on a Wednesday and I had kind of talked it over with the midwife. It wasn't my midwife that was my primary midwife, but during, in this practice, you kind of during the second half of pregnancy, see a different midwife every appointment to get to know them before possibly having them at your birth. And so this particular midwife, I talked it over with her, whether to, to have my membrane stripped or not. She said, yeah, I think that would that would be great to do. It was a little bit of a question of could this cause my water to break because I was GBS positive and I didn't want to be on the clock with that if I didn't need to, but made the decision that, yeah, I did want to have my membrane stripped. So I did that on a Wednesday. And that afternoon, I took myself to a movie uh, for the first time in a long time. And at the movie, I went to the restroom and I did have some good like bloody show mucus, that sort of thing. So I was really excited. I texted my husband from the theater like, oh, something might be happening, but no, no contractions or anything that day. But The following day, Thursday in the evening, I decided to do sort of a modified mile circuit. So not the full half hour of each of the different kind of poses or exercises, but 10 or 15 minutes of each to try and kind of open things up and get things aligned. And right after that, I was running a bath to to hop in the bath and started feeling a little crampy. And I'm like, all right, I'll get in the bath and the cramps will go away. This is not the real thing. I'm not quite 40 weeks yet. But I got in the bath that night at 9.30 or 10 and the cramps just started coming at a regular basis um, at maybe eight minutes apart and then seven. And then I tried to go to bed. My husband and I both, we got in bed. I told him, you know, I'm feeling crampy. We'll see. And he went right to sleep, but I, of course, did not and was totally that first time mom amateur that was supposed to rest and just I could not sleep. So I ended up getting up, going out to our main kind of living area, and I spent the whole evening kind of feeling these cramps ramp up to really being contractions while I like finished our thank you notes for our baby shower gifts. And then I watched a show on Netflix that I had been holding out on to watch while I was in early, early labor. And um, and then things just kind of progressed from there where I think it was like 6 a.m. Um, my contractions were between three and four minutes apart, lasting at least a minute. And that was really consistent. So I was like, okay, this is the real deal. And my husband slept the whole night. I didn't wake him up. I felt like I could kind of handle things on my own and let him get some sleep. So once contractions got kind of tough enough that I really needed to kind of work through them, I would do a circle around the island in our kitchen and then when the contraction started, I would just brace myself on the counter and sort of lean over and breathe through it as much as I could. And so in the morning, my parents were going to come over to watch our dog while we were at the hospital and then meet the baby as soon as they could at once they were born. And so I texted my dad and I said, hey, call me when you're up. Don't wake up mom yet. You don't need to come over. But like, I think I'm in labor. And so I ended up talking to my dad. Eric heard me talking to him. So he got up and then things just kind of rolled from there where we talked to our doula a couple times to check in. And she said, you know, keep doing what you're doing. And then around probably 7.30 in the morning, we called the midwives and I chatted with a midwife and needed to stop every two or three minutes for a contraction. And she said, yeah, it sounds like things are pretty regular. They're intense enough that I didn't want to talk with her through them. And she said, it sounds like you're having a baby today. Come in anytime. And so when our doula eventually arrived around eight in the morning, we said, hey, contractions are three minutes apart. They happen for a while. I think we're ready to go to the hospital. So we headed in and the car ride was, it felt like I was kind of coherent and and felt okay between contractions, but then a contraction would come and it was like, holy moly, this is totally awful being in the car and not being able to move around, especially. I remember in the car thinking to myself during one of my more coherent moments, like, oh, this, I'm going to be just like my mom was with me. I was her first. She labored through the night, went to the hospital early in the morning. I was born at 6.37 a.m. So I'm like, oh, I am totally going to get there, be, you know, seven centimeters, 
this baby's going to be out by late morning and I'm going to order brunch from a really good place down the street from the hospital. (laughs) And I look back at that now and I'm like, oh my God, I was so, so clueless. So we got to the hospital, went into triage. I went through a a couple contractions in the little, like the area where we pulled into valet our car because we're in downtown Chicago and got checked in and the nurse checked me when we were in the triage room and I found out that I was only three centimeters dilated. And I had been two centimeters two days before that when my membranes were stripped and I was so discouraged. I was like speechless that I had kind of labored through the night that the contractions were coming so regularly and I wasn't making any progress. I don't know if I had like a full on crying (laughs) period at that point, but I was really discouraged. And the nurse told us we could stay in triage for a couple of hours and see if I progressed, but she wasn't sure if the midwife that was on that day would even admit me at three centimeters. Um, And they said, you could, you know, go home and continue laboring, but I really didn't want to go back home. It was like a 20, 25 minute drive. I just, I just didn't quite know what to do. So we decided to stick around in triage for a bit longer. And when they took my vitals, they said I had slightly elevated blood pressure. And it wasn't like super duper high, but it was high enough that they wanted to run some extra labs and check and just make sure there wasn't early signs of preeclampsia. And so they did that. And because of the elevated blood pressure, and I think just (laughs) us sitting in triage for a couple of hours, another nurse came in eventually and said, the midwife will admit you and you can go upstairs. And my doula had supported a lot of births at this hospital. And she said, that's going to be way better. You're going to get upstairs. You're going to have more room. You're going to have a birth ball. You're going to have a peanut ball. You're going to have a shower. You're going to have all these different tools that we could use to to labor. So she just thought that would be way better than, you know, stuck in this little room in triage. So by 10:30 or 11, we had moved upstairs and from then until 3 or 4 that afternoon, we continued to labor and Eric and then our doula Becca supported me the whole time and I spent a lot of time, I'd say that my most comfortable position to get through a contraction was kind of bent over holding on to the bed and just kind of bracing myself and standing up. And so I did a lot of that, but we also, our doula said, you know, why don't you get into the shower for a bit? And so I sat on a birth ball in the shower and Eric sprayed my back with water, but the water didn't get very hot. So like that was (laughs) a little bit of a tough thing for it to like really be the best it could be. And, And this hospital had 30 plus birthing suites and one or two working tubs. So a tub was not an option that was readily available. So we we kind of worked with what we had, but by around three or four that afternoon, I got checked again and it only made it to around four centimeters. So we weren't progressing very quickly for sure. And at that point I was really tired, um, just pretty discouraged, but trying to keep a good attitude about everything. But our midwife, the midwife and actually a student midwife that was on that day, they were really respectful of my birth preferences. They had actually sat down when I had been admitted and talked through them with me and knew that I was trying to have as few interventions as possible. But they also realized I'd been kind of at this overnight and was was tired and discouraged and concerned about not making progress. So that afternoon, they sat down with me and I, I let them know, and I first let Eric know actually, that I just, I think I could have survived getting through it as we had been, but I didn't know if I wanted to continue um, that way. So we had a talk and the midwife I told her this later at at my follow-up appointment, the way that she approached kind of talking me through the options made me feel so kind of heard and empowered to make a choice versus someone telling me, you're not progressing and you need to, we need to get a move on here. So you need to do this. She walked me through the possibility of narcotics. We talked about nitrous oxide and we talked about an epidural and, um, 
potentially using Pitocin to help move things along. Um, and again, that was suggested not not just to speed things up for the sake of speeding it up, but there was a little bit of a concern of preeclampsia still. So I think that was on everyone's mind. Um, and so we decided that I did want to get an epidural at that point. And the anesthesia team came in did the epidural. I wasn't honestly nervous about getting an epidural and it wasn't a fear of the epidural that was kind of leading me to want to have an unmedicated birth. It was more that I'd heard and read a lot about babies being more drowsy after they were born if you'd had an epidural and needing to be on IV fluids and that raising the baby's birth weight so that they would drop more weight after birth. And that could be something that's looked at as risky, things like that. So that was kind of the main reasons why I didn't want to have the epidural. And I honestly wanted to be there and be and feel as much <laughs> of this process of having this baby as, as I could. Um, but I did end up getting the epidural it, it went really smoothly. I had an amazing nurse that sat with me and talked with me and really distracted me completely from what was going on behind me um, the whole time. And so I got the epidural and then about an hour later, they started Pitocin. But an hour after that, I still hadn't progressed. I was still at around four centimeters. So again, we had a conversation with the midwife and she said, the next thing that she would recommend is breaking my water. So we said, yep, let's let's go ahead and do that. And so I think around 6 or 6.30 that evening, my waters were broken and I didn't know it at the time, but my doula had been texting with our other doula that kind of was on call to, to step in if needed and said, you know, I don't know how long this is going to take Liz to progress. You might need to come in for me tomorrow morning if we're still here. And I guess I didn't mention at all that this whole time my baby was sunny side up. So that may have been part of what was preventing a lot of progress in dilating. So between 6.30 and 9, after my water was broken, I progressed from 4 centimeters to 10 and baby entirely rotated to be in an amazing position for, for pushing and giving birth. So when my midwife checked my dilation around nine to see if there was any progress. It was like a party in the room <laughs> and just like them cheering, me being like, are you serious? And then all of a sudden it went from this, you know, kind of discouraging situation of, you know, how am I going to have this vaginal birth? Am I going to progress? What's going on to prep for pushing and, and a really kind of celebratory atmosphere. So that, that was the labor process. Yeah. That's so, that's such a good example of like how the dilation is not an exact formula. Oh my gosh. Yeah. But it can be so discouraging when it's not progressing, but I love that celebratory. I can just picture yeah. that in the room. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. So all of a sudden it was, let's get you ready to push. Yeah. They asked me if I wanted to, I was, I had been laying in the bed. I had been flipping side to side with a peanut ball to, to kind of help open things up. But they asked if I wanted to try, you know, side lying or, or another position, even though I had this epidural, but I said, no, I was comfortable and ready to do it kind of tilted up, but on my back. And so that's how we started the pushing process. And it, I had my husband on one side holding one leg, our doula on the other side holding the other leg, and then our, our midwife and a nurse um, that was helping kind of count through pushes. And I honestly didn't expect my husband to be kind of like in on the action like that. And he's a nervous guy that was very much like, I will stay at your head. And in the end, he was like watching everything so into it as her head was crowning, he was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Um, so that was really, really cool. And during the pushing process, I had been feeling the contractions enough through the epidural that I had said I'd been starting to feel pressure. I was starting to feel enough contraction, quote unquote, pain that it was kind of taking my breath away again. So I, I was able to say when a contraction was coming and when I would would be pushing. And so I loved pushing and it was just everyone cheering me on. I had included in my birth preferences that my love language is words of affirmation. And I don't know if that, if the team was taking that into consideration or if they're just like amazingly supportive for every birthing person. But, um, 
everyone was just like, oh my God, Liz, you're doing so great. You're like, this is going so well. And I had a, a mirror in front of me to be able to look and see progress. And so we'd go kind of three pushes per contraction and the nurse would count to 10 while I did each push and then take kind of a short break and then continue pushing again. And I'd sort of close my eyes and push and push and then open them right at the end of the three pushes per contraction to kind of see my progress. And it was about 45 minutes total of pushing and our little one came out and she was put right on my chest and we did not know she was a girl um, and no one really thought to check at first. So they sort of were cleaning her off a little bit while she's on my chest. We did a delayed cord clamping for a couple of minutes. Eric cut her cord and then someone said, oh, we don't know if this is a boy or girl yet. My doula was taking photos kind of throughout the, the birth process. And there's even a little video of me being like, oh, he's so beautiful. I don't know if it's a boy. He's so beautiful. I don't know if it's a boy. And um, and we checked and holy moly, it was a girl. So it was uh, a crazy surprise and just so, so amazing to finally have her. And um, she was not like screaming and crying. She was pretty calm, which is kind of her personality now too. Um, but she she seemed to be doing fine. They took her to the warmer for a couple of minutes to kind of clear out her airways. They weighed her and she weighed in at six pounds, 11 ounces. And that was also her being a girl and her being a little tiny peanut was a surprise because the last ultrasound I'd had a few weeks before to check for growth restrictions, they had estimated her at that point at seven pounds, seven ounces. And I'm like, okay, so we're having a baby over eight pounds, but she ended up being just a little thing. And um, so after the, the quick kind of clearing the airways and and weighing her, she came back over to me. And I definitely remember during that couple of minutes, I was like, is she coming back to me soon? Um, really felt like don't keep her away from me a second longer than needed. And then after that, we had that that golden hour and um, it was, oh my gosh, it was so it just, I just couldn't even up until the point of when she was actually born, I couldn't believe that we were actually going to have a baby at the end of this after all the time and everything we'd gone through. And just having her there was amazing. And I was so excited to try and breastfeed. She latched within that first hour and our doula was taking pictures while she was latching. And it was, that was amazing. And we FaceTimed my parents who were already asleep at our house a few miles away to share the news with them right away. And then once we got to recovery that night, we called Eric's parents and it was like one in the morning for them. And they woke up to see her on FaceTime too. And it was just a really amazing special start to, to her arriving. So I'm like smiling ear to ear just thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> I am too listening. That's so wonderful. And I remember you, you know, sharing on the, the know your options zoom calls too. And you were just like talking a mile a minute. <laughs> so much to <Yeah>. share. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right. So what about like longer term postpartum? Yeah. Yeah. So overall I would say, breastfeeding has gone well. Um, during the first week or two, I definitely had the engorgement, painful nipples, definitely some cracking and bleeding. And my midwife ended up prescribing all-purpose nipple ointment, a APNO, APNO. Um, and that made all the difference for me. So definitely I would if people are listening and going through that right now, I would definitely recommend looking into a prescription for Apno if you're having any of that sort of issues. And then I had a, a clogged duct that a girlfriend of mine has gone through tons of issues with that during her postpartum period. So she helped me kind of deal with that. But besides that, breastfeeding went really well. And then I had um, a period of a couple of weeks where I had some significant SI joint pain. So it was kind of my lower back, right side, kind of going into my butt and the top of my legs to the point where I was like hobbling down the hall at our house and just not able to get around really well. So that was tough just to 
be going through the like learning how to take care of this baby and up a bunch of times at night and all of those things while also hobbling around and feeling like I couldn't walk. (laughs) Um, But luckily I went back to my pelvic floor PT that I had seen during pregnancy, went back to my chiropractor and got some really great care and some exercises that I could easily do for a few minutes a day. And it sort of resolved itself within two to three weeks. So that was not long lasting, luckily. And then the only other thing that we've kind of dealt with so far that was a bit of a curveball was Emmeline ended up having what we think is a milk protein intolerance. So she had some kind of weird stool uh, about a month in and we had it tested and there was blood in her stool. And the pediatrician just kind of said the most likely culprit for something like that is usually a milk protein intolerance. So I am now dairy free for a while. And luckily within a a couple weeks of me going dairy free, her stool has gotten better. She didn't have any other kind of horrible symptoms, no like major diaper rash or fussiness or anything like that. So we've, we've been very lucky with that. And I'm going for a few months dairy free and then we'll do some reintroduction when she's, we've decided around six months, we'll reintroduce and see if that has gotten better for her yet or not. They say often infants will outgrow it between six months and a year. So fingers crossed, we will be able to do that. But besides that, she's a really great sleeper. She's very easygoing and just oh, her giving us her first smiles. It just like melts us every time. And, um, and it's been really special. And we've now slowly been able to have a few friends and other family members over besides my parents were there to meet her. They came to the hospital to meet her. So that was wonderful. And actually my in-laws are visiting right now to, to meet her for the first time. They're from farther away. So it's been uh, really special despite kind of COVID and having a winter baby preventing a lot of visitors, um, but we're enjoying that now as she's getting a little older and hardier. (laughs) Awesome. All right. Well, what resources do you want to share? I thought of a few and I sent over a list to you, so I won't list them all because I know we've been talking for a long time already, but I would say on the fertility side of things, the biggest one is an online resource and community that I relied on so much during my fertility journey. And at the time I was going through it, it was called the Fertility Tribe. It is now called Rescripted. Um, so I'll give you that website. So for anyone that might be listening that's that's going through fertility struggles, that is huge. And then for pregnancy and childbirth and child rearing kind of resources, definitely Ina May's Guide to Childbirth. I read that cover to cover, and I'll be honest and say I think I read it too early in my pregnancy and wish I had read it more during kind of the second part of my third trimester. But I I loved that. It was very kind of helpful technically and then also just inspirational. And then I also read the Mama Natural week-by-week guide to pregnancy and childbirth, and that was super helpful. And then besides the Birth Hour podcast, my other favorite pregnancy-related podcast was Dr. Berlin's Informed Pregnancy Podcast. He has great guests on that talk about a lot of great topics and also has a few birth stories on his podcast as well. He's a doula and a chiropractor out in the LA area. So a really interesting perspective. And then one other one that I think I've heard um, mentioned recently for the first time on the birth hour is Carrie Locker, who is a baby mother nurse in a hospital and then also a mama for herself. And she has an Instagram account with tons and tons of new baby and birth related resources and she also has a website and, and online courses you can take that has been really invaluable f- to me for the first few weeks of, you know, any topic that I have that's whether it's breastfeeding or, you know, my baby is doing this or not doing this. She has something on Instagram to, to cover that in her kind of saved stories. So that's a big one. And then I would say the other thing is the fitness classes I did um, nationally fit for mom is a really, really awesome organization for camaraderie and for the fitness aspect of it. 
And then in the Chicago area, I joined a studio called Prenatal Fit that has amazing classes. And again, a great group of women there to talk about things through pregnancy and postpartum. And then the Chicago Family Picnic, where I did our childbirth class and um, they have doula services. I'm doing a mom and me, mom and baby class now. There um, is an amazing resource for, for anyone listening that's in Chicago. All right. And then what's the best place for people to connect with you? I would say the best place would be on Instagram. That's where I, I'm most active on social media. And my handle there is Lizzie Lee 17, L I Z Z Y L E I G H. One seven, And I'd love to connect with anyone that would want to talk about any of these different topics, fertility, pregnancy, birth, et cetera. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Liz, for sharing today. Thanks so much, friend. It was great talking to you. All right. Now we're going to chat with Kaylee about Pre-Mama Wellness, today's sponsor. And don't forget, you can use the coupon code BIRTHHOUR25 for 25% off at premamawellness.com. All right. Let's hear from Kaylee. Hi, Kaylee. Thank you so much for coming on the birth hour today to chat with me about pre-mama wellness. I'm so excited to have you. Hi, Bryn. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here today. Great. Can you tell listeners a little bit about you and what you do at pre-mama? Sure. So my name is Kaylee Harlow. I've actually been with pre-mama wellness since 2016. So wow, the years are flying by. Um, I'm on the marketing team. We're a really small team of four people entirely, but um, I do the social media and I head our community space um, on Facebook. And I also kind of do a little bit of everything from a marketing standpoint, just because we're so small. So um, I'm excited to be here to chat a little bit more about the brand today. Great. And you're a mom too, right? So you have that perspective as well. I am. Yes. I have a 17 month old daughter. So she was born in May, 2020, kind of in the thick of all the craziness Mm. that we all went through. So, um, she's awesome. She, she's running around, she's learning her words and, and it's, it's been an amazing experience, albeit it's been different than I was anticipating with everything going on in the world. But, um, but I love her so much. Yeah. All right. Great. Well, um, let's start by just talking about the different offerings that Premama has for maternity wellness. So you guys kind of cover all the different stages. I would love to hear more about that. Yeah. So we're an entire stage system and that's what, what kind of makes us unique. Um, we start when you're thinking about trying. So say your hormones are out of balance or you're coming off of birth control. Um, we have our balanced drink mix. And then we also have fertility support offerings for both her and for him. So I think that's what's really great because you want to get your partner involved as much as possible. And also a lot of um, infertility or fertility challenges are also male contributed as well. So I think it's important that that we involve our partners, especially when it comes to our health and our nutrition. Um, we have our prenatal vitamin offerings, and this is my favorite vitamin that I took throughout my entire pregnancy and also through my second pregnancy right now. Um, and it has folate. We use folate, not folic acid, and we use all the the natural ingredients, um, no additives, preservatives, or fillers. Um, all of our supplements are gluten-free, vegan, vegetarian, and we just want to make sure um, using our science advisory board that we're putting the best nutrients in our products so that you know that what you're putting into your body is best for you and best for baby. I love that. And we've talked a lot about on this podcast about the different types of folate and how important that is and how we're learning so much more about why it's really important for certain people and everything. So I loved seeing that. And then also that your vitamin has iron in it. That's something that I struggled with in all of my pregnancies. So that's great Me too. Me too. Yeah. And it, it's the gentle form of iron too. Mm-hmm. It's, it's ferrous fumarate. So it, we make sure um, also through the pill that you take, um, it's a tiny capsule within a capsule. So the nutrients absorb at the best points in the digestive tract. So that helps you alleviate the nausea, which which I've been struggling with naturally. So imagine mm-hmm. you don't want to take a vitamin that's going to make it worse. Yeah. And then um, the fact that it's all vegan, I know that's important to a lot of people. And you guys yeah. have the omega-3 and the choline. It's just really like, I'm kind of amazed how it all fits. And it's a relatively like small pill too. It is. And, and we're lucky. Um, the technology that we use is patented. So all of those nutrients are able to fit. Um, and, and they're just also crucial, right? Like the omegas that we use, they're, they're vegan too, which is actually the best form of omegas because it's coming directly from the plant. Usually if it's coming from a fish, they eat the plants and that's what gives right. them the algae. Um, so, so we know that you're still getting the best format. That actually is a form that, that NASA founded. That's really cool. All right. And then you have some things for after baby is born as well, right? 
Yes. And this was like, honestly, aside from the prenatal for postpartum, my first experience, I thought I was prepared. And then you get there and you're kind of like, oh my goodness, like <laughs> my body's going through so much while I'm also trying to care for my baby. And, and it takes a lot out of you. And especially through my own birth experience, it wasn't, didn't really go as planned. And, and my recovery was a lot harder than I expected. Um, so to have a supplement that I knew I could take daily that would help ensure that everything I'm getting in my body um, is helping me recover and helping my body um, physically, but also mentally Mm -hmm. um, was huge for me because I think the transformation physically is one thing, but there's, there's a mental one too, especially going through everything we all went through the last almost two years now. So um, yeah, and we have, there's two nutrients in the postnatal vitamin. It's called PQQ. I would try to say the scientific term, but I'll totally butcher it. (laughs) And safserine, and they're both clinically studied to help improve mental clarity and cognition and and even alleviate um, symptoms of baby blues, which we all go through when we have, you're on the highest of highs with your hormones when you're pregnant. And then as soon as you have baby, they just plummet. So it, it really takes a toll. Yeah, that brain fog is real. I remember just not being able to like think of words. <laughs> it's the strangest feeling. So it really anything is. that helps is good. <laughs> and it's so true. Um, and then our final postnatal offering is our lactation support. So when I was breastfeeding, my milk supply kind of went up and down, and I was able to take this as needed to help improve my supply and also fortify it. So there's nutrients that you're drinking that also go into your milk supply that go to baby. So um, fenugreek fennel seed, blessed thistle. We also have a fenugreek free offering. So for women that maybe sometimes their babies are sensitive or they can get gassy, um, they can use the other kind that doesn't have it. And that's like a drink mix, right? Or is this a vitamin as well? It is. So this, this is a drink mix. Um, our, so our fertility products are drink mixes. Our pills are our um, prenatal vitamin and postnatal vitamin. And then our lactation supports a drink mix. Okay, very cool. Yeah, I noticed in the lactation drink mix, it also has vitamin D, which is something that I was low in when I got all my blood levels done after having a baby. So I think that's a great thing to have as well. Yeah, I know it's so helpful, especially with mood too. That's another Mm -hmm. one that I, I just felt such a difference when I was taking it. Awesome. All right. So can you just tell people about like how it works as far as getting the products? I know you guys have like a subscribe and save option, that kind of thing. We do. So if you go to our website, you can subscribe to the system. Um, Depending on where you start, you can really start at any point in the system. But say you are starting from the beginning, you would subscribe to our balanced drink mix. And then as you go, we'll send you emails and you can update your status along the way. And if you have any questions, um, we really pride ourselves in, in being supportive. So Our small team does answer everyone and all the inquiries. And we also have um, Facebook communities um, that women can join for trying to conceive as well as modern motherhood. Um, So you can find us there as well. But um, to order on our website, it's premamawellness.com. And we do have a code um, for birth hour listeners. That's birth hour 25 for 25% off. And that includes subscriptions and bundles. So oh, wow, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That's so great. Yeah, I love everything on your website. It's just really beautiful packaging and everything too, which um, can Thank seem like you. a little thing, but I think it's important too. <laughs> oh yeah, we love the aesthetic. It's nice yeah. on my nightstand or nice in my bathroom on the counter so I don't forget every morning. It's just a cool little reminder. Definitely. Well, thank you so much for sharing a bit more about all these different products. I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me today. Oh, thank you, Brenda. It was my pleasure. All right. So again, people can go to premamawellness.com and use the coupon code birthhour25 for 25% off. And we'll be sure to link to that in the podcast app and on the show notes page as well. Thanks again, Kaylee, for chatting with me. Thanks, Bren. Thank you so much again to Liz for sharing her birth story with us and to Pre-Mama Wellness for sponsoring this episode. Don't forget, you can go to premamawellness.com and use the code BIRTHHOUR25 for 25% off your purchase. And if you want more information from today's episode, just head over to thebirthhour.com and pop Liz's name into the search bar and you'll find her show notes page. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.